Hey, it's your pal Mike Shea from Sly Flourish, here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. This is a show shot 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Times on Twitch, in which I go through steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my Sunday D&D game. In this case, I am running a homebrew Eberron game called Eberron the Second Morning. This show, like all of the work of Sly Flourish, is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. If you want to help support this show uh, with things like equipment and things like the bandwidth costs and website costs and all of the other associated costs that it keeps me to keep uh, to, to keep Sly Flourish going, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Sly Flourish and becoming a patron. Uh, patrons get uh, exclusive access to a bunch of different things, a bunch of interesting material that I put out that, that's uh, uh, for them and previews of things that are coming out in the future. Uh, they also get access to a Discord chat uh, that all the time and uh, all, all different kinds of things. And But mostly you're there to help support uh, this show and all of the other stuff that I'm putting out, blog articles, videos, and all other kinds of things I'm doing. So... Uh, boy, last week was a fun session. Uh, it was crazy. It was it was a really crazy, fun, wild session. So the characters had snuck into. So um, let me give a a ten second. I don't know if I can do a 10 second summary. I'm gonna to try to do the most abbreviated summary uh, I can. The characters are trying to stop uh, a, a, a number of villains from building a new weapon of mourning, a new weapon capable of the destructive power of the weapon that caused uh, the, the mourning and destroyed the mournland, destroyed Sire and turned it into the mournland. Uh, the primary villain is a uh, Oni, a very powerful Oni aristocrat named uh, Leto Skull. Uh, Leto Skull has uh, rejoined an alliance with the daughters of Sorakel, who are the leaders of the monstrous nation of the Droam. The Droam is seeking the daughters and are and the Droam are seeking the weapon of mourning, so that they have a weapon of mutual destruction that can help them become a ratified nation according to the Treaty of Thronehold. They want to be. Um, they want to. They want to strengthen their nation and know that no. Uh, none of the other nations will will come and uh, will come after them if they know they have a weapon this powerful. So uh, that's their goal. I don't know what Leto Skull's exact goal is. He kind of lost his angle, uh, and now I think he's kind of just working for the daughters. But he's an opportunist who will seek no He will seek every opportunity to get an upper hand and to get power for himself, including rejoining the characters or 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 allying with the characters. So that's kind of an interesting thing I'm keeping in the back of my head. So those are the villains. The characters have been traveling across the Mornland uh, aboard a very powerful sentient warforged train called Karshak. Uh, Karshak was a one of the many weapons of the last war that uh, House Kenneth and um, the nation of Breland and Sire had built. Uh, in this case, it was Sire who built it. And uh, Karshak was originally suicidal and now is trying to recover the sentient memory crystal of their mate, another powerful Warforged vehicle, another powerful Warforged um, train known as Mycenta. So the memory crystal for Mycenta was held by a House Orion, uh, an agent of House Orion named Geneth de Orion. And um, uh, Geneth was being protected by a bunch of assassins of uh, House Therani who were trying to use, I know it's not 10 seconds. I know, sorry, I'm terrible. Um, House Therani, but really this is a summary for the last game. So I've, I've stopped the, the main summary was the, just the part about getting the weapon, stopping the weapon. Um, so House Therani uh, and a, their, their, their dragon-marked member of House Therani, known as Needle, uh, she was trying to get this sentient memory crystal because she knew that there was tons of blackmail material, that Mycenta had tons of blackmail material against members of multiple uh, dragon-marked houses. And if she could sort of tap into the memories of this of this um, of this warforged memory crystal she could get all that black mammal material so the characters uh, snuck into the Academy of Eberron a uh, Eberron the progenitor dragon in a ruined town uh, known as Faragon and in the t in the in the Academy uh, they kind of were sneaking around a little bit and then were soon discovered and when they were discovered, they started a conversation with the members of House Therani. And 
uh, all the House Thorani people, all, not all the House Thorani, but all the, all the members of the House Thorani uh, guild that was in this place all showed up. And it was like 14 people, including two assassins, a bunch of spies, I think six spies, a couple of veterans, and four displacer beasts that were pets, invisible displacer beasts that were the pets of House Thorani. And Needle was there, and her foppy brother was there, and um, uh, Geneth de Orion was there. And our the monk was sneaking up. So the monk stayed in the shadows and kind of snuck around and got closer to Geneth, who has the, he's holding the satchel close to his chest, right? And uh, and Needle is like, who are you guys? And they started off with a ploy of like, we're just explorers and we just popped into this place to explore. And she's looking at them and she says, you're the guys that killed that super powerful monster out there, right? And they're like, yeah. And they go, well, that monster was our protection from a really dangerous artifact, a really dangerous Warforged creation known as Karshak that's trying to kill us. And now we have to move because that, that crazy train is gonna, is gonna come kill us. And they said, huh, how about that? We don't know anything about that. And she's like, really? And they said, yeah, we don't know anything about that. And she's like, okay, well, you guys can go explore. There's the tons of rolled ruins here and there's tons of old stuff below and we're gonna leave, right? And she knows like the party is powerful because she saw them kill the, the Calarail, a really, really powerful artifact eating massive mutated gorilla creature uh, called the Calarail. So she's like, you killed the Calarail. So we know you're not nothing, right? We know that you've got some power to you. Um, but according to your own BS, you don't want anything to do with us. And they're like, well, and then they switch and they're like, actually, does he have something that, you know, we want? And he's like, no, why would he have anything you want? They're like, well, we think we want that thing. And she's like, I don't think you do. And then they're like, yeah, we're going to need that. And she's like, kill them. And all of a sudden, two assassins, six spies, two or three veterans and a bunch of displacer beasts all jumped on them at once. Oh, and a couple of mages. And the very first, and guess who won initiative? The monsters. And guess what they did? Fireballed the party twice. So two guys stepped, and here's a here's a power, power trick for you. Mages, this is one where like monsters are sometimes smarter than we are. And enemy spellcasting wizards are smarter than we are. A, a, a tactic the enemy spellcasting wizard will always take is I step more than 30 feet away. I step more than 60 feet away before I start casting spells. And because like, I've got three counterspellers in the group and they're all like, can we counterspell? I'm like, they knew you have it, right? They're not idiots. And it costs them nothing to take three steps back before casting fireball. And they did, they went boop and then dropped fireballs. And um, so the party got hit with whatever, 40, 54 points of damage. Do I have that math right? 56 points, two fireballs, 28 or 56, somewhere on the order. Um, and two of the five party members dropped immediately. They were they dropped on turn one. And then all the displacer beasts and everything came out. And it was bedlam. And everyone's like, holy cow, I've got like one dude who's standing's like, I've got four displacer beasts on me right now. And the assassin, so the assassins are like, let's get the hell out of here. And and they start to grab Geneth and they're heading out while everyone else is jumping on the, this group and doing a pretty good job, right? And we thought it was going to be, all of us thought, this is going to be a TPK. They're going to get wiped out. And in the back of my head, I'm like, how's this going to work out? Like, And and my thought was, well, you can do the deus ex machina, literally the god in the, oh, I love it. Deus ex machina, literal deus ex machina, because Karshak is a god. Karshak is worshipped as a god by his followers, their followers in Eston. Um, so they're theoretic, Karshak is theoretically a god and also a machine. So the god in the machine could show up with a bunch of powerful warforged, um, uh, powerful warforged soldiers, storm the doors and maybe rescue the party after they get TPK'd. But I'd probably do like a fail forward sort of thing. So party won't get wiped out, but the the thing is on the move and now there's like a chase to go get a hold of this thing. You know, it could be really, could be really fun. Yeah, Sn Snark Knight says, don't F with House Therani. Yeah, House Therani's nasty. So um, anyway, what did happen is our monk who had been hiding and didn't get fireballed by anything, he says, I'm going to run up and grab that satchel and, and run. And the group is like, that sounds good. And he runs up and he goes, yoink. And he grabs, you know, he's got, he's a shifter and he snatches the bag and dives off the balcony, you know, does a roll. And with monk speed, which is like 90 feet a second, 90 feet around, he's heading out the door. And all of a sudden the assassin's like, 
get him stop him he's running off with the satchel right and everyone's like what and then and then here's another one that saved the day is the warforged or the the uh the warlock uh, uh shift casts greater or cast invisibility i think i don't think she casts greater invis i think she casts regular invisibility as a fifth level spell because she is a 10th level um warlock and that gave or f- her and three of the others that were caught in the fireballs and are now up with healing um made them all invisible and so all of a sudden they disappear and everyone else is like oh my god the rest of the group disappeared right and then all of them are like we're getting out of here and so they start running to the door and they, they they managed to use other abilities to get people up that weren't spells so they didn't break invisibility they're considering diving off of balconies but they're like i've got four hit points like i'm gonna take the stairs i'll take a little bit of the longer run and i'll take the stairs and so they were running around and people were like freaking out and the mages are like readying actions like as soon as i see anybody because i know they're gonna press invisibility eventually i'm gonna hit them with a lightning bolt right and they're getting ready to fire lightning bolts around and all of them are running towards the door and and the the the, the house the ronnie guys are running after them and then the doors burst open and six of car shack's dread riders uh, Dread Riders are like really powerful Warforge constructs that have like, uh, they have like uh, Eldritch Blast guns. And the Dread Riders come in and the the House Therani people are like, oh, oh right? Because they're like, no, we were protected from the Dread Riders because of the Calorail. Calorail's gone. We're in trouble. And one of the Dread Riders turns towards one of the characters and it's Karshak's voice. And he says, do you have it? And they're like, uh 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 and he's like do you have it and like yes and like go back to the train and then they the 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 warforge walk in the doors close and parts of the building start to explode and the characters are like let's go back to the train and then they get to the train and they do like the animated skid stop and they're like are we scared about car shack now too like is it if we go into this train holding this thing are we essentially giving up all of our leverage, you know? And meanwhile, a bill boom, the, the Academy of Eberron explodes behind them. And they're like, huh, that didn't work out well for the House Durrani guys. And they're like, you know, what, uh, are, we, are we worried? And then, so they go in and there's um, uh, Deloitte, who is uh, Karshak's sort of um, uh, conductor, sort of the major, the major domo, Karshak's major domo, who's dressed in a tuxedo and carrying a silver platter with little wet naps. Uh, the wet naps have... Um, pressed a digitation on them so you can take a wet nap and dab yourself and you go super clean and um he says do you have do you have the object and they say uh uh and then karshak's voice says give it to him right and and karshak's voice like illuminates everywhere you know and they're like uh uh and it's like give it to him now and they're like oh and so they hand, they take it, the, 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 they open the bag for the first time. <laughs> what if it wasn't there? What if it's back in the never on? There's a panic attack where they see a bunch of other stuff. And then, you know, here's the object. And they take it out and they hand it to Deloitte. And Deloitte looks at it and they, he turns it and he goes, it's broken. And that was where the game ended. And it was like this perfect and like all the players are like oh no <laughs> like we just we just brought a broken docent to Karshak like and he can disintegrate people you know or he can he can seal the chamber and suck all the air out and just have us fall over dead if he wants like we're real we're in real trouble and um and now they have a broken docent so uh it was a really like it's it's great when the timing works out and it's not you know, I'm, I don't, luck probably plays a huge factor, but when the timing works out and the pacing works out that you can end on such an awesome story cliffhanger, finish off a whole chapter, ready for your next chapter and still have this really awesome cliffhanger ending. Um, I love doing that. And I love it when it works out that way. So that's where the game starts. And luckily I know what my strong start is going to be. Uh, so let's go to our notes. Uh, I am using the tool Notion to do all of my campaign planning. You can find out all about it in the notes below if you're watching on the YouTube or if you're on Twitch right now. Um, I just pasted the link for articles about how to use Notion. Uh, I also have a video that I just posted on YouTube a couple weeks ago, last week. Pretty popular video about using Notion for campaign planning. So I suggest you take a look at that. And uh, those of you in chat, um, throughout the remaining 
uh, 45 minutes of our time, people will continually say, hey, what tool is Mike using for this? And when they say that, type uh, uh, exclamation mark notion and it will post those links so that uh, nobody has to bother to type it all in. Um, so that, that, that is a, a way to help out if you wanna help out uh, during, during the show here. Uh, so we are going to start by generating a new session planning template. You almost said bang notion. I did almost say bang notion, but no one knows what bang means. That's a, that's nerd talk. Uh, so I generate a new session temp template. It is the 13th. Uh, and we start by reviewing the character. So I've made a couple of changes to my notion template, which you may notice. The first thing is I customized my notion template, my, my session template, uh, to make it a little easier for me to type stuff in. I found that I've been deleting a lot of things every time. I found that there's like a lot of editing that I had to do every time. And I was like, you know, I'm just gonna clean this up. So this is a cleaner version of the template that I've customized for this game. What I suggest you do when you're running Notion on your own is go and customize your own session generating template. I have all the video talks about how to do that and make it your own. The other thing is I consolidated the characters into one view. So I, I, before I had sort of two views of, I had a character database and then I had two separate pages that were views into the database. And I was like, you know, that's like three pages when I only need one. And also it meant that I had to have different links in here depending on which session I was gonna run. So instead, uh, I'm just gonna have the single character database and I have a filter where I can filter that game is my Sunday game. And I have, uh, I can also view it as either a gallery mode, uh, which I can use, is there a, uh, I thought that there was a card size. We'll do card size small. Uh, so these are the characters for my Sunday game. So this way, like, for example, I can now go over to filter and I can say filter by Wednesday and it shows my Wednesday characters. So that way I'm just using, um, uh, this way I'm just using the same page, uh, the same database for everything. So the characters is a database page. Uh, so this is the portrait view and, or the gallery view. And so the six characters I have today, I have Zarentir Delander, uh, who I think is gonna make it today. Uh, Zarentir is a member of House uh, Lar Larendar and uh, former war, or former airship, uh, crashed his father's airship twice, sort of a member of an arist uh, arist aristocratic family. Um, storm, all about storm stuff. Storm sorcerer, storm cleric, uh, mark of the storm, loves to cast empowered lightning bolts um, and, and is, yeah. It's great. One of the many counterspellers we have in this group. I think we have three counterspellers and I think he's one of them. Uh, Saber was the savior of the day last time. Uh, Saber is a uh, shifter monk, members of the uh, four, way, four winds monk group and um, is a bounty hunter and knew a lot about House Therani. Uh, Shift is one of the original Warforged uh, built by House Kenneth. And she has a brother named Crash who is inside of her head. She now also has a piece of a, a bone uh, etched and wrapped in, in old leather and etched with symbols that lets her communicate to her patron who is, and I don't think I've made this crystal clear, so it's probably a good secret. Uh, her patron is um, Lady Elmaro. So we're gonna, since I'm thinking about it, we're gonna go and make that a secret right away. Uh, uh, that doesn't, uh, so Lady Omaro is Shift's patron. That doesn't mean Shift has to like it. Um, so uh, we have Shane Husk, famed novelist and uh, writer of books about the, the morning, uh, a, a hobgoblin, uh, a hobgoblin wizard. Uh, I forget what kind of wizard. I think it's the run-up and slashy type wizard, but casts, casts a lot of different spells. Uh, and we have Banner, who is a... Um, the Banner is not going to be able to make it uh, to, to today's game. Banner has got... Uh, Joe has things he's doing. And Arwen Chi Sizu. Uh, Chi is a... Oh, and oh, this is going to be tough because Banner is gone. So I need to, I need to think about the docent and how that's going to work. Um, it would suck for Banner to lose an object when he's gone. Um, that's a, that's a, there's going to be a, there's going to be a trick. I mean, it's something we got to think about for the game today. Um, Arwen Chi Sizu Chi is a, um, dragon marked member of House Civis. Uh, her father is, uh, Hrun, uh, Hrun Sizu, who is inside the docent that is inside Banner's head. Uh, so Banner has, uh, uh, you know, Banner's got, got Hrun in there. 
And I think uh, Haroon might take over. So Banner will be walking around with Haroon, with Haroon there. Uh, so those are the characters for today's game. Karshak insists someone has a data port installed. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. We, so we got to figure that out. One of the things is like, so what are the options when it comes to fixing the docent? But that's, so that's where we go to our strong start. So the strong stoat, the, uh, my centas docent is broken. Uh, this makes Karshak angry. Um, so, uh, it seems like the tension you want to is to give up a resource versus advance the plot. I don't know. So I don't, I try not to think too much about like, you know, what feeling am I going for here? Right. I, 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 I want the story to just go organically. I don't, I don't aim for particular feelings or styles. Um, I, I want, I, I want to build a situation and set up a situation and let it happen. But I also don't want them to get screwed. So, you know, the real question is, uh, they uh, obviously it's like, what can they do to fix the docent? Now it's possible between Haroon, who is an artificer and Chi that they might be able to fix it. So, um, well, we're going to do a little subheading here. Uh, so the docent options are um, uh, Hrun, uh, I think it's Hrun, H-U-R-N. Uh, we'll, we'll hyperlink that. There we go. Hrun, Sizu, and Chi. Um, Hrun Sizu and uh, Hrun and uh, Chi can potentially fix the docent. They might be able to do that on their own. Uh, there might be a risk of like, if they screw it up, they could destroy my Senta. <laughs> and if they do that, they're going to be in serious trouble. Now, maybe that's like, you have to fail. If you roll with advantage, you have to fail badly, like by five or more on both dice. So like, it could be a low risk, like a two or, you know, like a... 10% risk, but you better be ready because Karshak will lose it. So that's one option. The other option is uh, that, and I think this is where sacrifice comes in. Haroon can be sacrificed. Uh, Haroon can be sacrificed for my Senta's gain. Um, That'll be a nice heart tugger. I get addicted to the linking. So who can be sacrificed to transfer my Senta's memories to the, to Karshak. So, and, and in this case, um, so the, one of the things I don't want to do is the, the docent is actually a magic item in, um, uh, it's actually a D and D magic item. Uh, and it's a good one. Um, and I don't want, um, I don't want to take that feature away from Banner as we're doing this. Um, so, uh, I think what could happen, so so a way that this could happen, let's say they decide, yes, we'll, we'll go ahead. Haroon is already dead. Like Haroon isn't a warforged. Haroon was a, was a gnome, a gnome artificer whose kind of personality got moved into a docent. But the reality is that's not really Haroon. It's a copy, right? It's a copy of Haroon. It's not Haroon's spirits. Haroon's spirit's already out there. It's a copy of Haroon's personality. Um which is kind of a fun little thing. So Hrun could say, if you pull my crystal, I'm going to be destroyed. Like I, you, you, like I, unlike other artificer, unlike other Warforged things, when you pull mine, it's gone. It'll never, be, it won't be back again. Um, you can put my Senta into the docent, take the docent out of banner, give the docent and my Senta over to Karshak. My Senta will be copied over into Karshak's big brain chasm 
up ahead, uh, car number two in the train. And then the, the docent can be returned, but it'll be returned with um, a, a, like a subcopy of uh, Mycenta and Karshak in it. And that can go back in Banner. And now Banner will have Karshak and Mycenta as the um, sentience in the docent. Um, so Banner will still get back what they want. We'll shift one personality for another. It'll get, it, it means they can keep um, this kind of interesting personality in the characters. Um, so that's a possible option. Uh, another option is that they try to fix it. Is there any other, so, so people in chat, can you think of another way the characters could, uh, fix the docent without destroying, without needing the one that they've got? Is there another, is there another way to do it? You know, is there some way I'm not thinking of? I got two good options, and I could just lay those two. I don't know if there's a third. Uh, I do like the idea. So I know I just I just pushed the whole idea of like you know you you're going for sacrifice, but you obviously want it to mean something. Like either it's a risk, you know, you want something that's risky. You do want tension. So yeah, I, I Scipio, I apologize. I kind of gave you crap for saying like you know it seems like you want tension. I do want tension. You're right. <laughs> and I was like I don't like to do tension. This is a story. But then I'm like no, I do want tension. So yeah, I take it back. Uh. So, uh, the dark abyss keeper says perhaps the docent has a base firmware. I, I was just thinking about that and I'm thinking actually it's more interesting if it has a copy. So here's what is going to happen when my Senta and Karshak, when their personalities are joined together in the big brain car, two cars up, they are going to turn into a new entity, uh, known as, uh, it's in my NPC section. Because they're not, the personalities are not, they are sort of like gods, right? My shack. No, not my shack. Um, NPCs. Uh, oh, come on. Where is it? Is it under villains? Did I have it under villains? Are they villains? It's not under villains. Let me check the campaign database. I'm probably pretty sure it's in the campaign database. Let's go to... Uh, I want to make these, uh, card size small. Valis, it is under, um, uh, so Valis is the joining of, uh, my Senta and Karshak into a new entity. Hey, look, Katie at 134 remembered more than I did. So, uh, we'll go back to my notes and we'll put that in the NPCs. Um, and a secret and clue is when Karshak and Mycenta are joined, are brought together, they will form a new entity, uh, known as Velus with aspects of both personalities become a new thing. Um, uh, so Valis could be the personality that is now, I don't think it'll be a copy of Valis completely. It, I don't know if it'll even be connected to Valis prime, but a copy of Valis will be in the, in the docent and can talk to them. Uh, about it. And maybe it can use like a sending stone to, um, uh, maybe it can, uh, maybe it can use like a sending stone to sort of reconnect, uh, reconnect with the, with Valus prime. So you have docent Valus. Docent Valus is a copy, a limited copy of Valus prime who resides in the second car of Karshak. Um, hook up a broken docent with a working docent as a stopgap to give limited time for a side quest mentioned above the ticking clock. Yeah, I, so I think I'm, I, 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 a part of this is I need to get him to the next chapter of this whole 
campaign too, though. So I'm not, I don't need more side quests. They've already had two side quests on their journey across uh, the Mornland. They had to do the dam, um, the dam of the Galifarian kings, and then they had to do uh, Faragon and get Mycenta. So I don't want to do a third. I, it's time to take them to the glass plateau. Uh, so another secret is that Karshak uh, can only take the characters as far as the edge of the glass of the glass plateau they will have to make the journey themselves um another secret is that um uh strange magic permeates um i can't spell permeates why what uh, uh, the uh, strange magic permeates the glass plateau, um, making magic unreliable. Um, uh, an airship named two airships, right? Uh, two airships, uh, and we will, uh, I'm going to cheat here. So we have Glass Plateau, do, 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 do. and we have Making, and we have Claw Rift. Um, and we actually have a few areas in Making. We have the uh, Deep Tunnels. I'll have to look them up. Uh, actually, I can look them up in making. Do I have 44 backlinks to making? Look at that. That's crazy. Show me show me all of them. Show me all the links. Um, mostly session notes. Spire of the Silver Flame and the Dark Tunnels and Shattered Laboratory are two locations that I can link to. Um, Spire Silver Flames and Dark Dark Tunnels and Shattered Laboratory. Uh, those are some locations I've already built up for my other for my other game that are inside the city making. So uh, two airships. So I know one of them is in the Glass Plateau. We're going to talk all about the the Glass Plateau in a minute here. Uh, I think I have a map. There it is, uh, the Wave Crest. Uh, you can see my terrible handwriting. Uh, so there's an airship called the Wave Crest uh, that crashed here. Uh, the Wave Crest and the other one uh, crashed in making. And we look in here and it was called, uh, hey, look, my point crawl. Do, 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 do. We're going to get into this. Uh, the Sky Dancer. Wave Crest and Sky Dancer. Uh, Two airships, the Wave Crest and the Sky Dancer, crashed over making and the glass plateau. And these were House Lirandar airships, too. I don't know if I'm spelling Lirandar right. Good enough. Uh, so that's kind of a fun, those are fun hooks for my, uh, for, for Pat's character, for um, Zarentir. Um, when you're starving for secrets, think about the characters, right? And you should do that anyway, right? Like generally speaking, when you're thinking about stuff, if you get stuck, think about the characters, right? Put your mind back to them. Be like, what secrets can I? So you're like, uh, Lady Omaro, like, is there anything more? Boy, I, I love the Lady Omaro thing. Are there more Emerald Claw agents in uh, making in the Glass Plateau? Um, did she send, probably she did, right? I wouldn't mind sending some, uh, yeah, so I think like uh, agents of the Emerald Claw have come to making um, to try to to try to grab the weapon. 
uh, from uh, the draw. So that's one. Um, let's see, other other character connections. Is there anything with Chi? I've got a lot going on with Chi and her father. Um, probably that house, well, no, they're, they're, they're house Sizu. They're not house Kaneth. Uh, so one of the most advanced house Kaneth laboratories um uh, uh existed in making no one had no one knows what happened to it no one knows what state it's in now uh so that's a good one what am i at here one two three four five six seven eight i've got two more secrets um we will hang on to those we'll skip back so scene wise what do we have fixing the docent is a scene uh very likely that's going to lead towards valis introducing valis uh then we go to the glass plateau And that, uh, and then they have to, you know, then they choose a path, right? So, oh, what did I do? Uh, and then they travel across their glass plateau. They get to making, and then they get to, they figure out how to get through making, and then they get to uh, Claw Rift. And that is it for the campaign. So, um, uh, so we've got that. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm probably some more secrets and clues are gonna come up. So let's talk about uh, the glass plateau. Um, so the glass plateau surrounds making, and it was caused by the um, it was caused by the morning. So the the making is the epicenter of whatever happened during the morning, uh, and then the glass plateau is around that, and then it goes out further. So it's really like the most twisted and dangerous like you're getting to like one of the most dangerous places to travel in uh in corvair right uh uh oh what just happened whoa weird things happened um but everything looks fine so uh uh yeah, so uh, so what I did is I so my, my other group is a couple weeks ahead. They're about two or three weeks ahead at this point. Um, so I've already done a bunch of stuff for the glass plateau, and we're gonna look at it now. And last week I talked about point crawls, and I and and glass plateau is the first place that I did a rudimentary point crawl, and I didn't use all of the point crawly sort of things like loopbacks and dead ends and shortcuts and stuff like that, that sort of makes the point Carl really interesting. I did that more with making, and we'll talk about that when I get there. So I, I, I threw some evocative artwork that kind of inspired my ideas. And um, uh, one of them was this creature, which I loved. It's actually from, it's from Magic the Gathering. Uh, but I think it actually works really well as a bone collector. So if we, if we go into D&D Beyond, and you look up Bone Collector. Oh, come on. Right? Oh, Cadaver Collector. Let's we'll do Collector. Um, this one looks kind of dumb. I mean, I guess it's like sinister and stuff. It's carrying corpses and stuff like that, and it's got crows on it. But, you know, which looks cooler? That guy or that guy? I think this guy looks cool. Frixian Rebirth. Yeah, the magic, the magic nerds are out. Uh, so I was like, that's my cadaver collector. It's going to be this huge, titanic, multi-armed, multi-leg thing crawling across the ruins of the dead, devouring souls, right? And the cadaver collector, this one I think looks a little dumb, uh, but like it's tough, 189, challenge rating 14. We remember what we said about challenge ratings. So, and it summons specters, right? Which is pretty cool. It can, it, I like that it breathes specters, right? That is cool. I ran this for my um, Wednesday game and I had it breathing specters every round and boy, that scared them. They're like, we got to kill these. They were fighting one of them and it was like, you know, his big head would loll back and forth. I really wanted like a Dark Souls boss, 
I'm in all, I'm into the Dark Souls these days. And um, the idea of this like huge multi-arm thing slamming and then breathing, you know, uh, breathing specters. <laughs> it's just, that makes me giggle. Uh, so that is a, that's sort of the boss fight at the end of the road. Uh, so we will paste the collectors in the monster section. Um, let's see, kill some of this stuff. Uh, go back to Glass Plateau. So uh, I expect the Glass Plateau to take a session, right? Or maybe even two, we'll see. Uh, but getting across the Glass Plateau is probably going to take some time. The other thing is I I, I like the, I wanted to use some of the uh, spell effects from uh, Tasha's, from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. So I have a link here to the Mirror Zone effects. And the Mirror Zone, this is from Tasha's. And the idea here is like weird stuff can happen. So you kind of want to choose when to throw this in. It's sort of like a DM intrusion if you think about it from a uh, from a cipher system sort of standpoint. When it seems right, every so often when they cast a spell or they do something, right? You know, there's there's a whole description of like when these should happen. I should probably read that. Um, one of these things can occur. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. When when I did it, it was copies of the characters showed up and attack and attack them. So it's kind of an interesting way. Um, yeah, you grow a goatee. One random creature in the region gains the benefit of blink for a minute. The, the, the. So um, let's let's take a quick gander at when these things are supposed to occur. So this is all in Tasha's. These are the environmental effects that Tasha's added. And there's some real good ones in here. So uh, environmental hazards, uh, fantastic challenges, any locale, ways to further bring adventure session to life. When creatures name appears in blah, 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 blah. Uh, not all land thrives, blah, 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 blah. Supernatural regions permeated by pre preternatural force in the area as large as small as you wish. Okay, so I can just use it. Affected area, certain effects of brief encounters reinforce the underlying theme. Um, characters traverse. Uh, so effects in the region occur whenever you please at the time each description suggests or under one or more of the following circumstances. Soon after the party first enters the region, when a creature loses more than half its hit points, when a creature casts a spell of first level or higher, when a creature activates a magic item, when a creature makes an exceptionally loud noise. So you, you really can do it whenever you want. That's what they're basically saying. Um, let's go back to mirror. Uh, why, did it, why didn't it jump to mirror zone? Ugh. I don't feel like scrolling to the right spot. There we go. So mirror zone. Consider rolling on the mirror zone table when the following circumstances occur in the region. A creature shatters a mirror. A creature uses any teleportation magic. An illusion appears. A creature impersonates another creature. Uh, so those are kind of interesting, right? And, and I'll probably do those. But it's also like, well, whenever it feels right. Like this is something the DM can throw in. This is something I'm going to throw in. Whenever it feels right. So... A lot of cool effects. It's just a, a fun way to make the glass plateau feel different and weird and and kind of dangerous. Um, so I have you know other images. Th these these two images. This is sort of the final image. I, I I like to imagine that that beam and the clouds around it. This is probably another Magic the Gathering card. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is. And um, that's what they will see when they when they when they get across it and see making. Right? They'll see that you know something's happening and making right now. And really what's happening is that uh, the daughters have begun to um, start the process to try to build a weapon. Um, <laughs> a Dark Abyss Keeper says, whenever something happens that makes you think, oh, that's sort of mirrory. Yeah. Uh, I have these environmental effects. Um, but uh, I'm going to yank this. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, when I originally wrote it, uh, I originally, when I originally started putting together a glass plateau page, uh, it was before, Zan uh, before Tasha's was out. So I also have some like fun things. Like if I want some weather, you know, I have some weather options here. Um, I have a generic list of locations, but I think this is out of date and I have some encounters that I threw in here, which I thought might be, might be kind of fun. Um, Uh, and then sort of, you know, some other pictures, right, of what the Mornland looks like that's taken from auto paces. And then I have the point crawl. This is my first attempt at a point crawl, and it's not great. But basically I said um, there are, and maybe, I don't know, I got 15 minutes? I could, yeah. I might be able to whip up a point crawl in this. So 
um, I wanted three paths. I wanted that when they came out of Karshak Station, they looked out and they saw the glass plateau. They saw this tremendous stuff and they knew that it's about a two day journey uh, to get across the glass plateau before they get to making. And uh, I, I said that on one side, there's the roads, the road of fallen iron, right? The road of fallen iron um, is a, and we, we could, we could try this. So let's see. Um, what's the site? Uh, damn it. Graphviz.it. So we go to graphviz. What? Is it V I Z? Ah. Sorry, URL troubles. There we go. Okay. So we're in the Graph Viz page. Uh, and I don't know, this might work better in the smaller window. Um, let's find out if it works better down here. I doubt it. I think it's going to be too. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do a lot of scrolling around. Um, so we are just doing a graph and uh, we have, so let's see if we have Karshak, we have Karshak station and uh, our graph is gonna be a unidirectional, it, it's or omnidirectional, either either direction. Uh, let me close that window up. It's bothering me. And we have um, road of shattered iron. Um, we also have we have two other places. Uh, we have the uh, obsidian uh, spires, and we have. Uh, the plane of glass, right? So that is our real simple initial, um, you know, decision tree. There's three different places that they can go, right? And 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 start to head out that way. Um, then we can. Um, uh, let's go back over here. So we have sort of our locations. Uh, is it called the pane of glass? Yeah, the pane of glass. That's pretty, pretty funny. Uh, let me open this up in a bigger. So then we have a uh, road of fallen iron. Uh, road of fallen iron. And uh, that is connected to the crater, uh, the crater. Oh, so here's a trick. If, if they're linear like this, we can just tag them right together. Uh, and, but actually, um, yeah. So the obsidian spires So I think actually, let's see, if I take this part and bring it up here, why is there a double loop around there? Oh, is that because it's linking to itself? Probably. There it goes. Um, so I have obsidian spires, obelisk, uh, of Dalcor, um, So now you can see how we're sort of whipping this together, right? We have the Road of Fallen Iron, the Crater of the Glass Army, we have Karshak Station, Obsidian Spires, Obelisk of Dalcor, Wavecrest Crash, and the Glass Army. And then we have the Plane of Glass. 
Um, and we have the acid pits. Um, we have um, um, our, uh, our, our trays gate. Um, slaughter field. of Karnath and the Glass Army. And now, uh, let's see, can we open this up? So that's an example of what it looks like now. And you can see that like the Road of Fallen Iron. So we actually, I've got, I've got something I can add to the Road of Fallen Iron. Uh, I wish there was a, boy, this text editor. Um, I wish there was an easier, like a way to, to co collapse this window. So uh, in the crater, we're gonna have, um, the flesh, uh, impaled fleshborn. So now we've got another, another thing that uh, is happening over on the road side. So that is like three, so the plane of glass has uh, more stuff in it than the other ones. You could probably get rid of the acid pit. Oh, the plane of glass also has the mirrors. So it definitely has too much. Um, so we're gonna replace the acid pits. Maybe we could put that somewhere else. Uh, And um, so now one of the questions is like, if, if you're going to, so, so let's, uh, let's open that up again. Um, so, um, uh, so do you just tell the PCs the names of the locations or have them learn it? So I would tell them those first ones. I would say like, they know about the first three choices. They're starting at car. Oh shit. Of course, all of these end at one place, which is gates of making. Um, so now, what did I just do? I created a fork. I did not want to do that. I hope that I hope that's okay. Uh, so that all roads lead to um, the gates of making. It has three paths there. I guess I guess that that's a uh, I guess that's a side effect. If I do if I just do um, uh, a separate line. I wouldn't have to type it out three stupid times like I did. Sorry, you guys are, you know, sorry, podcast people can't see any of this. Um, so essentially I've uh, created a, let's see, this SVG, open that up. There we go. So um, it's a it's but this is really pretty linear, right? So this is not so what I've got, and I'm sorry, podcast people, if you happen to be listening to podcasts, you can't see any of this. Uh, you probably want to check out the YouTube video when you're looking at it. But essentially, I've got three paths: the road of fallen iron, the obsidian spires, and the plane of glass. And the characters can choose which one of these paths they want to take. Uh, along that path, they run into various things like the crater, the impaled fleshborn, um, the and then and then all roads lead to the glass army. The glass army is outside of making a, a few miles outside of making, probably 10, 10 miles or so from the gates of making, is an entire army uh, that looks like they're in battle or they're all turning and looking towards making. They were in the middle of a battle. They're all looking towards making. They're all now made out of glass, right? All of these like like opaque glass pointing that way, sort of like um, Pompeii, right? And um, uh, they, uh, and, and it's there where the collectors are walking among them, finding sparks of their souls that are still inside these glass and are plucking them and eating them and devouring the souls. And that's why they've got specters swirling around them. 
Uh, so that's kind of the the glass. That's where the glass army is. And then 10 miles further from there is where you get to the gates of making. And then we have a whole other point crawl. But one of the questions is like, you know, this is really linear. You pick one of your three paths and you hit like three locations. So one of the reasons to have it that way is if like you only want it to be a session or so, right? But one way to deal with this is like, so we've got too many. We're playing a glass, the mirrors, the slaughter field of Karnath on one side. So one of the things you want to do is, is you want to, um, Jacoy, uh, I think it's Jacoy. I don't know how it's pronounced. Jacoy. Uh, Sam Dillon helped per, help me figure out how to pronounce it. Jacoy. So we want to Jacoy up our map here. Uh, Janelle Jacoy is a cartographer that had done a bunch of D&D stuff in the past. And she has a very interesting style of, of non-linearity for dungeon stuff. Read the Alexandrian's article on jQuaying the dungeon. It's an excellent article. The question is, can you, can you jQuay up your, um, jQuays up your, your point crawls too? And the answer is yes. So how do you jQuay it up? You have loops, you have shortcuts, you have secret paths, um, you know, stuff like that. So you can, you can add in some other elements to it. So one thing we're going to do is like this, a trades, a trades, Gateway, we're going to make that a secret path. Uh, so we are, um, and where 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 was it? So uh, we're gonna make it off of the mirrors. So from the mirrors. Um, and there's a way to style you. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do in GraphViz to style up your lines. Like do dot, dot, you know, dashed, da, dotted, dashed lines. Um, uh, so let's go back to, um, plane of glass, and we're going to take out uh, a trades gateway. And we're going to make it a side, a side thingy. So now if you look, uh, we have the mirrors as their own, it's got its own little subpath, right? A trades gateway is off to the side. It is a secret path. Um, there is a way to do a dash line. I, if, I would do a dash line to do a secret path, but I can't remember. You got to do a bunch of styling. And I don't have time. Um, another might be kind of looping back. So what if um, there was a, a, a path that led from the slaughter field of Karnath to the wave crest? Right. If you wanted another secret, uh, so like the the wave crest could be its own secret path uh, that's off of the obsidian spires. So we're gonna this uh, this is probably gonna do some weird stuff. Um, uh, and then we remove obsidian uh, wave crest crash from the obsidian spires. Um, main line. And we, so now you see that wave, wave crest crash is connected and maybe you can get to the wave crest from the slaughter field of Karnath, right? So, um, So now we have, let's, let's take a look at this in um, our window. Uh, so now it's big and wide, hard to see. Um, but now we've got some loops, right? There's, there's, a, nice, um, there's a nice loop. Hey, can, uh, is, do we have any admins on who can, can block that? Uh, uh, I need to report, block. I don't feel like reporting spammers. Now, why doesn't it get rid of it? I need to learn the bot thing. Oh man, I know I hosed up my... Oh, I wish I hadn't done this. <sighs> There's some way to remove people and I should know how to do this. Well, we're at the end of the show anyway. Um, so you can see that I've got like a bunch of, uh, I sort of added some some things onto the path here. Let me get back to my other window. 
Uh, I've got some a little bit of loops. Um, you know, I could let's see, like if the uh, I could create like off of the crater. We'll do one more just for funsies, uh, and we're gonna say that the crater uh, has a connection to the acid pits, and uh, the acid pits have a connection to. Uh, what? Um, uh, whoops, these are old ones. It's the crater to the obelisk of Dalcor. All right, and now we've got a really kind of interesting, um, now we've got a lot of interesting like loops. Uh, we've got, I don't think we have, we have like one dead end with uh, uh, a trades gateway. We can make some of these paths sort of secret paths that you can't see unless you sort of discover them. But we've really got sort of a, I, I really dig this. So this is this is kind of a neat, um, a neat point crawl. Now, what you're thinking is like, yeah, but what the hell's behind all this stuff? Well, I don't know. So like, I kind of know, you know, I know I, I'm, I'm using terms like this to help me improvise, right? That when I when I see something like the acid pits, something comes to your mind, right? And I think something will come to my mind. And are there monsters there? I don't know. Maybe I'll roll an encounter and see. Um, you know, obelisk of Dalcor. I don't know what that will be. So, you know, I think that there will be. Um, I, you know, I'm using those terms to to help inspire me when I'm running the game. Um, so one thing I'm going to do though, is we definitely want to add this. Um, I'm going to save to ping and, uh, I want to grab the text of it and we're going to put that into notion here. So I'm going to go in here, uh, code, uh, this is, I don't know. It's not anything. So we're just going to keep it the way. So that I've got the text in here. Uh, so that way I can rebuild it again if I need to. Uh, and then image, and I upload an image. And we have the image in there. So now I've got it in Notion as well. And I can recreate it in GraphViz. And because I can never remember the URL, uh, I will um, grab the URL and uh, put it down there. Um, yeah, so that's how I took this like this hand drawn. Now the other thing is like, so I use GraphViz because it's kind of fun, right? It's kind of cool. It's got a lot of features. You, you saw like I was able to build this really quickly just just typing it out. Uh, so I so I kind of dig that, and it gives a nice readable point crawl view. But you could also just do it with with um, paper, right? You could uh, hey, I got it rated, yay. Um. So um. You could just do it with pen and paper, right? Just draw it out, right? Or sticky notes. Probably a good way to do it is write each location name on a sticky note, put them all out and move them around where you want them and then draw lines and then and then clean it up. So, um, but I do like graph is as a, as a way to, um, uh, what did I just do? Oh, well, I can always put it back. Um, I don't know. I, 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 this was the best solution I could find online. And I did a lot of looking for quickly building a, um, quickly building like a, a, a flow, a flow chart basically. Right. That, that lets you, that lets you see, uh, where the hell everybody's going. Uh, so I think that that is it for today's show. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, for podcast people, I am sorry that you had to hear me muck around with something that is largely visual, uh, such as life. Uh, you can check out the YouTube video. You can either, hopefully you skipped it, that part, and you can go to YouTube and check it out on YouTube. Um, I'm going to thank everybody for coming. And uh, I always have a great time on these shows. Love chatting with D&D with you guys. So thank you all very much. Thank you to the Patreon uh, supporters for going to patreon.com slash Flourish and supporting the Sly Flourish Empire helping to uh, keep up bandwidth and equipment. I had to buy a new camera. Uh, my old camera was flaking out. So I got a new camera and what else did I get? Uh, a new micro, uh, not, this microphone's old, but I've got another new microphone for other stuff and bandwidth and website costs and everything else. They help, they help cover all that. So thank you very much. Have a great week 
And next week, we will be back online and see where things went. So thank you very much, and get out there and play some D&D.